Iowa Annual Conference 2022. It's great to see you here. It's great to be together again. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Kayla Cater, uh, supporting Practical Farmers today. Um, this session with Hans and Katie Bishop is sharing to have them acres and we're really excited to, to hear, have them share their wisdom with us today. Um, this is going to be a 60 minute session and there'll be some time for Q&A throughout, some time for Q&A at the end. If you uh, are news, um, back There is going to be some interpretation. Um, so we thank our interpreter, uh, who will be transmitting from the back of the room. She's giving us a little wave back there. Um, and I just want to remind everybody, um, you know, and so a welcoming space for everyone. Um, I also want to thank everyone for wearing masks. Um, uh, you know, it's been such a strange time and it's really nice to all be here together, keeping each other safe. So I will remind everyone that are not snacking. I just want to thank you for, for helping out with that. Uh, I think that, I think that all the house cleaning for the session. So I want to give a warm, warm welcome to Katie and Hans Bishop. Can you hear me? Good? Yeah. With through the mask, all is good? Okay. So he's here for when I'm wrong, he can correct me. <laughs> but I'm going to let him kind of sit down through it. First of all, I just want to say how excited I am to be in a room again. You guys, I've missed this community so much. So I hope you all can agree with that. I want to also let you know that what I'm going to talk to you about in terms of where our farm has been and where we're going. is going to be very different than what's right for your farms. So when Jacqueline from PFI asked me to come speak, we were talking about how my farm was drastically changing. And when I was thinking about this, in response to COVID and how we were handling shifting and evolving and changing has been the core of our business since we first started. So I can't really talk to you about what we're doing now without kind of going back and talking to you about where we, where we came from. And I also want to add Feel free, I, this is, I want this to be super, super casual and relaxed. So please, please don't wait until the end. So Prairie Earth Farm is located in central Illinois, far, far away from here. And just two, I might. Leave since the 70s, right? It was a conventional corn and soybean farm. Hans's dad owned it. And operated it. So that's Hans over on the left on his little tractor, and that's him and his dad. And just over the creek was 600 acres of at all. So Hans and I met at State Farm Insurance, the corporate headquarters is in Bloomington, Illinois. And it, Hans had given up on the idea of farming, wasn't interested, wanted to be a city boy. Glad I did, because that's And we realized we were very, very unhappy in a cubicle. And we really wanted to do something with purpose and meaning that we could do and outside. So Hans his dad and said, hey, can I come work on the farm for you? And as a matter of fact, 
But he said, I'll give you a little bit of land to use. You can start your own thing. And so in 2009, we grew a little bit of garlic. Do you remember how much it was? A thousand garlic. <laughs> but we all have to start somewhere, I guess. And we made plans all winter and started seeds in our townhouse basement under grow lights. Eventually, we had a plan. Our community. So we started growing things in what was essentially his backyard. That was our little plot of lettuce. And when it was time in May, we went to the first farmer's market. And I was so Everything being some wild garlic that we found, some perennial herbs in Hans's mom's garden, some very sick transplants that we had extra of. I think we probably made $50, but I was ecstatic. I was so excited. This is what we're going to do. So to do that, we were going to have to quit our job. And to do that, we needed to grow more. Right? So we got a 30 member CSA. We did a bunch of advertising. We were able to secure 30 members. Enough. There was no affordable health care, so I needed health insurance. So we stayed on. So 30 member CSA, a tiny little market stand, and a whole lot of work because I was still working full time. We put in so many hours for this quarter of an acre vegetable farm. And started dipping into season extension. We had the first intern who, very bad idea, we let her live with us in our townhouse. Totally would not do that again. So then over the next five years, we grew even more. And we started selling wholesale and we started Land. Also during this time, Yahoo, I got to quit my job and come to the farm full time, which was wonderful. But that mean we had to keep growing because we needed money, right, to pay for all of these bills and all. Twenty acres, twenty-five acres, not of lettuce. I'm sorry, not of lettuce, <laughs> of vegetables. And our little market stall space turned into four stall spaces at multiple markets throughout the community. Operation, which was a huge part of our spring revenue. We had garden day events on the farm. We started selling these plants wholesale. And around this time, our CSA uh, retention rate started dropping. I think this was a thing kind of say, did anybody else experience this? If you guys have a vegetable farm, nobody were we? Yeah, if there's a nine, I was going to say, please don't let us be the only one. <laughs> we were spending more money and taking more time to try to retain the members that we had. a choice CSA model, a custom box program. Uh, we used Farmigo was the software program. And our CSA grew a ton. And our retention rate got back up into the 70s again. And this took so much work. By this this time, we were, Hans, help me, how many acres? Acres, with no real good infrastructure on the farm, except for some hoop houses. Didn't have proper image. Had no, 
so everything had to be lifted by hand, no walk-in cooler space. So we took out a big loan and we purchased, uh, or we built this facility with very large, large coolers and now we can get forklifts and carts and massive amounts of cooler space. So every, yes. Yeah, so I'm gonna repeat the question because this is being recorded. Um, grow and build the infrastructure in 2012, 2017, or did we just, what did you call it, lean farm it basically through there to grow? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember actually. We didn't really take out any, we didn't. Equipment. Hans loves and, and so we spent every dollar that we made at the end of the year on equipment. Everything. I mean, we have been extremely thrifty in other if we don't have children. Sometimes against my better judgment. <laughs> It was always a good purchase. He's always right when he wants to buy it. He just has to kind of talk me into it sometimes. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think we made some mistakes in terms of infrastructure. Shed or coolers for way too We're very inefficient with how we would load the market trailer or load wholesale orders and we are now GAP certified, and I think we could pass a FISMA audit without and get anybody sick because it just wasn't a safe environment to work in. We didn't have, you know, employee break areas or a place to clock in or clock out. We had those hoop houses, which we utilized as much as we could for spaces like that. I mean, we walked vegetables in a hoop. Is that about right, Hans? Do you think that that's accurate? Okay. So each one of those bulk bins in the cooler weighs about 700 pounds full of beets, carrots, turnips, radishes, various types of cabbage. Uh, and then in other coolers, hemp controlled, we we have sweet potatoes and various types of potatoes, onions, garlic. So this is our winter production. We started moving to winter production because it was a great niche for us. There was all year round. Plus it helped us retain employees around, which was really important to us too. And we had great harvesting, mechanical harvesting equipment. We just didn't have a place to store it or to keep it at the right temperature. So we use a combination of six or eight insulated shipping containers with cool bots or temp controllers with heaters to keep the vegetables at just the right temperature. So then the next three years, I'm, I'm on the farm full time. I'm working to market this farm and has become a problem for, for us and we're, we're just
retraining people every single year. We have some great staff, by the way. Money. In response to that, that, we have to keep growing more and more food. So in 2020, one of our biggest goals, it was actually, I think, 2019, we started selling to Whole Foods. Kale to Whole Foods, come to the farm, make it right up, which was fantastic. Despite some people's beliefs about Jeff Bezos, they actually paid a really good price for our kale, which was wonderful. And we were able to start by the bag. We were pallet, which was fantastic, because now we have this concrete Yahoo, right? And then <laughs> Hans's dad decides to retire. And this was a curveball thrown at us because the vegetables at the time, about 60 of those acres. Everything else is either pasture for animals or organic corn and soybeans or wheat or cover crop, but it's not vegetables and it's not our responsibility. whole thing. Again, I don't know the exact amount, but altogether it's about 200, 250 acres that we did not want to grow vegetables on 250 acres. We did not want to bring livestock onto the farm and have to manage those pastures. Green fields for us. In exchange, he puts our his cows, his dairy cows, on our pasture and maintains the fence and the pasture so we don't have to do anything but look at the cute cows <laughs> out on the pasture. So that was an arrangement that actually worked. We didn't want to grow any more vegetables. Inevitably, we did grow more vegetables. And in 2020 and 2021, we got up to about 80 acres of vegetables. And then Hans started growing Grow crops as well. Said, I want more land. <laughs> Can I rent 80 acres and transition it to organic? And after a lot of battle and a lot of persuasion, they agreed to rent us 80 acres. And so Hans has transitioned that into a row crop. and all of these row crops. And then what happens? COVID. And I'm sure people can attest to it turning their lives upside down too, as it did for us. I still actually can remember planting carrots. This is the day. When I got an alert on my phone that the governor of Illinois was shutting down all the restaurants in the state. And we were selling a tremendous amount of produce to chefs and chefs. Yes. Which was a little overwhelming. We have people on staff, we have things planted, we have bills to pay. So we quickly started an online store because if things weren't complicated enough, why don't we throw something else into the mix? Still had roots in storage. And this was the first pickup. It was an amazing, I'll do it again. It took so much time to pack those. It was not, and at this Is more as a community. 
to custom pack every single order, the square fees for the credit card transactions, the staffing of the pickup. But it was also in a really incredible moment to see your community come At the same time, make up a third of our revenue. They did. And they typically start at the beginning of May. But we did not have any farmers markets in May and the first two weeks of June. And when they did open back up, the rules were But it sucked any profit profitability out of our market at all. So our rules at our market were that the customer couldn't touch the product. They couldn't even get close to the product. So we had to have this crowd controlled farms are stuff just gets crazy. All right, so what are we going to do moving forward? Because we have hit the point where we are done with the constant drama. We have to find a way to deal with what we know is going to be very unpredictable weather. It's going to happen every single year. We need a break. Our employees need a break. And this growth is not sustainable. And we also just don't want it anymore. We got to the point where we hated to be on the farm. We hated it. And I think we still kind of do. Like, we need to heal from that. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're taking 50% of the veg production out. No more, we're not growing that size anymore. We're putting it into grain because we have crop insurance. And it takes way less labor to grow corn and soybeans and wheat than it does 45 different types of vegetables all year round. We are scrapping our CSA. Now keep in mind, we quit doing markets. I didn't mention that, but I couldn't go back. I enjoyed my Saturdays off so much. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I could not go back. And I also saw how much time and effort and energy was saved by not doing the farmer's market anymore and not preparing the week before for sales that weren't even guaranteed yet. So we are now doing a CSA that starts in the middle of September and goes through January. So right now, previous to 2022, our CSA starts at the beginning or middle of May, goes all the way through October. Then the winter CSA picks up in October, goes all the way through January. And then there's multiple years where we keep going into February, which leaves us almost no break. So now we're gonna spend the summer actually farming and not trying to sell so much during that time when we really need to be focused on the crops that we're growing. And we're gonna grow way less diversity, not completely get rid of our diversity, because diversity for us has always been an excellent risk management tool, but we don't need to grow so many different crops if we're not having a large CSA or farmer's market during the main growing season. And we are, for cash flow and for customer retention, going to continue some form of a CSA, but only for small blocks during the spring and the summer, so that we have breaks between those blocks to get caught up if for some reason we do get flooded again. Or we, the opposite, it's dry and we have to get all the irrigation set up. Or maybe Hans and I get to go on vacation, which I can't even imagine what that's like in the summer for a farmer, but. We're, we're gonna try it. And then all of August, no CSA. Cause August is the worst month on a vegetable farm. And we are all hating the CSA by August. So we're just gonna take August off. Our customers are excited about this because they wanna go on vacation too. They're getting to go back to school. Things are stressful. They wanna go to the farmer's market. They might even have their own garden. I can't wait to see if this works. I hope that this works. But I, like I said, I don't know. We're going to try it though. It also means I don't have to grow any of that stuff ever again. You had a question. How many weeks are you going to do your CSA? Like, like a month, two months, three months? Like how many yeah. 
I haven't completely done the math adding in the winter. Okay. So the question was, how many weeks are we doing the CSA? And the spring is for June. Then we'll take a week off for the 4th of July and actually have the energy to stay up and see fireworks. That's my hope. And then we'll start again in July, four weeks in July, take August off, take the first couple of weeks of September off, and then start in on the, on the winter CSA. I mean, I say winter, but it, they'll still have tomatoes, but it won't be all of the summer crops in September. So we are never growing another watermelon ever and wondering if it's ripe before we pick it or to teach our employees how to know when it's ripe before we pick it. I don't have to lift those bins of heavy watermelons ever again, and I'm so excited. And we're done growing garlic. We grew garlic for the farmer's market and for the CSA because of the amount of crops we could get from garlic. You know, the green garlic, the fresh garlic, the garlic scape, the dried garlic. If we're not doing a CSA or farmer's market, we're not selling that very well wholesale. That's not a big demand for us. So we're just not gonna grow it anymore. Did you have a question? I love your presentation. And what, I'm, what I'm thinking about um, is what can we do here in, here in Iowa that, that adds diversity to corn and bean um, complex. And so I'm hearing you the stories, and I totally get what you're saying, you know, the amount of time and labor and so forth. But do you think with the market support and some configuration, somebody growing these kinds of crops, but just it's done maybe at another bigger scale? Yes, thank you for saying that. He's asking, are these crops still viable for farmers, basically, right? Is this still a good crops to grow for farmers? Absolutely, um, especially garlic. Garlic is such a great crop to grow. Um, it isn't viable for us with how our marketing is set up. It isn't viable for us because we don't like to grow these or we're not good at it but it absolutely is viable for lots of different sized farms. Small farms, medium sized farms, large farms, all can find success growing these crops. I'm not at all saying that they're not, that not to consider these, but when we had to put some on a chopping block, these were the ones that we really looked forward to getting rid of. <laughs> where, where is your operation Yeah, so he asked where the farm was. It's in, located in central Illinois near Bloomington. Bloomington, Illinois. Yep. So spring brassicas, we will still grow turnips and radishes, but we're not growing spring broccoli anymore. And we're not growing arugula and spiced salad mix and mustard greens and bok choy on a big scale anymore because of flea beetles. And we fought them forever and we're just done with it. Will we grow some of this stuff for the spring CSA? Yes, but it'll be on a much smaller manageable scale that we can cover with row crop instead of trying to grow an acre of broccoli. Am I right? Yeah, good. See, I know. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, so he, at, um, by the way, he's the rep for high mowing, if you're interested in talking about brassicas and field tomatoes and hot peppers and what have you. Um, so he asked what our experience was with Whole Foods and how that worked in terms of pricing and was it good to work with them, I think, and that type of thing. So they don't care that much about you, I have to be honest. It's not like working with a grocery cooperative or a CSA. Um, they're not gonna check in with you and make sure that everything is going well after a flood. And, but um, on, the, on the flip side, they're super easy going because they have to be. So if you can't meet what you said you would grow for them, they just roll with it and find somebody else. So all the pluses and minuses of working with someone without a relationship are present, if that makes sense. Like, does it suck to have, to work with people who really don't care about your sh staff shortages? Yeah, I mean, it's great to have a partner when you're working with your wholesale customers, but at the same time, it is really nice just to get in and get out and get done. The hardest part for us with Whole Foods is that they do require GAP certification for leafy greens, 
which was an expensive hurdle for us to overcome in terms of both the, the audit cost money. You actually have to pay for us anyway. We have to pay for the USDA person to come from the East Coast. Um, and then the insurance. So they require $5 million a $5 million liability insurance policy. And again, this may be specifically because of leafy greens, and they may not have the same rules in place for beets you know, or pumpkins or what have you. But for leafy greens, that $5 million policy is really, really expensive, and none of our other customers require that. So that was kind of a burden working um, with them. Uh, but we absolutely are still going to explore this relationship. They're, they're wanting to take collards and red kale this year, in addition to the eggplant and the green peppers and the green, green kale. Um, yeah, so it's a conversation. He asked if, if we are the ones that are soliciting this crop mix from Whole Foods, or do they come to us? And Hans has a meeting with the buyer. As you can expect, there's like multiple layers of people. <laughs> it's a real bureaucracy there. So you have the buyer and the regional buyer and the sourcer and the, I don't know, it's, it's pretty crazy. But so Hans works with those people to kind of say, this is what we have and this is what we'd like to sell you. And they can tell you whether they have room for that. We want to sell them winter roots. So we've said like, hey, we saw that you don't have local winter roots in the Chicago stores. Can we get in on that? And they're like, yeah, we already have somebody. So I think in some cases they have contracts with some pretty big growers that they're not willing to lose. But they have recently changed their philosophy on what local is. So they're really wanting regional and then hyper-local for some of their vegetables, which is wonderful. This is what we've been wanting them to do for a really long time. And as an example, they'll buy kale from farms and the, we, we sell into the Chicago wholesale or the Chicago warehouse for the district. Um, and the Chicago warehouses will take kale from Wisconsin farms and they'll take kale from Minnesota farms. I'm sure they'd take kale from Iowa farms, right? Michigan farms. But the ones in Chicago have said, Chicago needs to have Illinois first then Wisconsin, then Minnesota, which is great. That's wonderful. That's what we want. Yes, sir. Yes, so he asked if our identity is preserved, and it, it is because we choose to have it preserved. So we have custom twist ties that have our farm name on them, which is also another requirement if you're going to be selling to them is because they need to have that PLU code for them to ring it up on the register. So there's a cost involved in getting the plates to make the twist ties that have the PLU on them and what have you. Um, so our identity is preserved in that way. The signage just says, Organic green kale. Yep. Yeah. What, my follow up question is um, you identified, I think, one example the insurance policy, the $5 million. That, that's what Whole Foods wants, right? Yes. So, what, what are the things that you could envision the policymaker thinking about? How do we make it easier for you and people like you to do these different things? Insurance might be a, some kind of insurance support might be one. What are, what are some That's a great question. Yeah. I would love more people to ask that question to farmers, actually. So what he was asking, if you didn't hear, was what type of financial and policy barriers should we be talking about for farmers to reach these types of markets? Um, I think the financial barriers are kind of what I just said. It's really hard to come up with that type of money up front because it's a risk, especially if it's the first few years that you're growing that product. Especially, and also just this last year, we had such a labor shortage that we had to make some tough choices about going out and picking that kale because we needed to make back the money for the policy, you know, and for the gap audit, because that's an annual thing. So sometimes it felt like such a waste to go out there and pick it when we had so many other things to do and that wasn't the most profitable crop that we had, but because we had so much put into it, it was really hard to walk away. So I think that's part of it. 
Um, I think if we could talk about gap in a way where we can do that in an easier, uh, a, maybe not gap, but a step down from gap for leafy green farmers, because it is also very expensive to go through that gap process and the record keeping for than FISMA. So you're really doing like two completely different processes. So I think those are just a couple off of the top of my head. Um, I think sometimes though the cost is, we look at it as a barrier, but Whole Foods needs to know that the people that they're working with are going to be able to follow through on those orders. They're relying on them. And I think if they use it also as a tool to know if you're really serious, yeah. Yes. I did not hear the beginning part of that. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, she, yes, um, she asked what our licensing and certification are, kind of how we've started with that. So the farm was certified organic before Hans and I came to it. Um, I think Hans's dad had some livestock certifications because he was selling eggs and um, beef direct retail. Gosh, I think that's been it, actually. <laughs> we are certified under the Real Organic Project and our GAP audit. We haven't had a FISMA audit yet. So if anybody is here from that organization, please don't come. We're not ready for you yet. <laughs> it's coming, though. I know that it is. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Yes. Yeah. So he wants to know um, how how to get in with the big guys, like the process of getting in with the big guys. I guess I would say like Whole Foods or institutional grocery stores and that type of thing. Hans, I can answer this, but you know a lot more because you did it. So would you like to come come on? Yeah, come on. Uh, so with Whole Foods, uh, essentially you just got to know somebody and they've got to like sponsor you to actually um, get into, and it's literally the barn is their onboarding portal. So uh, you can call and leave messages and nobody calls you back and it's even a little bit uh, concerning when your sponsor doesn't return your calls and your Whole Foods is a big part of our operation. So uh, they they're just busy they've got a lot of different uh hats that they're wearing too and uh you know it's just one of those things you got to be patient and trust it and they've never let us down and i don't know how we could have gotten in without other people like helping push us in who are actually no longer selling to whole foods so yeah does that answer your question yes okay guys i have like two more slides and then we're going to just Freeform, whatever you guys have questions. So hold on, I just want to get through the rest of these. That slide is to remind me to say. Oh, duh, microphone. This slide is to remind me to say that I'm so happy and the heavens opened up and I never have to grow field tomatoes ever again. So we are going to grow tomatoes, lots of heirlooms, some cherries, but they're all being the hoop and that's it. Never again in the field. <laughs> I know some of you out there wish for that, and I just want to tell you it can be done. We should do it all. No more field tomatoes. Okay, so the question is how are we going to do some of this stuff, right? Like it all sounds great. So the first step is to have a really good budget because we need to know, we are going to be taking a cut in revenue since we're downsizing so much in terms of veg, but the grain hopefully will make up for some of that lost revenue but we still have employees to pay and I want the vegetable farm to pay the vegetable employees. I don't want the grain operation to subsidize the vegetable operation. I want them to be two separate things. So we have to budget the vegetable operation really carefully right now and over the next couple of years to make sure we're on track. And since we're cutting out so many crops, we need to know the cost of production of the ones that we're keeping and that's also how I can kind of know which ones to cut is because I do know how much it costs to produce 
those crops. It's also really important for me to maintain my customer base because I spent a lot of money and a lot of time building it. And I don't want to lose it because I'm suddenly not at the market or I'm not doing a regular CSA. So I am making decisions with them in mind. Those are my retail customers, since they made up such a big part of our business in the past. And also just to remember that that diversity, not just in crops, but in how we sell our product, is very, very important to our farm. That diversity allows us to continue to be flexible and gives us that form of risk management that we have relied on so many years in the past. And we have to have a plan B. If this doesn't work, what, what next? And at this point, our plan B is we're done with vegetables. <laughs> this is the last go. I don't know that our employees know this, so hopefully they don't watch the recording. Um, <laughs> I don't know if our family knows this, but if this doesn't work, I think we're gonna call it quits on veg or we just need some time to take a breath and bounce back after all of these years. And that's a possibility too. I just really quickly, I'm gonna breeze through these. There are two other farms that I know of and I, I actually know of a lot of farms that are kind of evaluating these next few years and changing how they're doing things. And some of that is res in response to COVID. A lot of it is in response to just very unpredictable weather crisis is happening year after year after year. And some of them I'm familiar with because we're all about the same age and we've all kind of hit this point where we've been doing it for that 12 to 15 year mark and we're tired. <laughs> and the buzz has worn off, you know? It's not that romantic, wonderful thing we thought it was. It still is a little bit, but it's not at all what we thought it was. So Raleigh's Hillside Farm, they are in Wisconsin. They have a very large CSA farm, almost exclusive CSA, husband and wife team. And this past year, they had a really big problem with drought. Their hoop house blew down, blew over, was destroyed. They have a baby, a newborn. <laughs> and so they have decided to call it quits for one year to evaluate whether this is really what they want to do. She's freelancing on the side. He's childcare with the hopes that when they do go back, the plan is just to do wholesale and just enough to supplement their income, but not be all of their income. Full hand farm. These guys are in central Indiana and like us, they're really heavy in winter production. Um, and they had a problem with their carrots for fall storage germinating. And it would, that was just enough catalyst for them to say, time out, we're doing something we don't want to do anymore. So rather than quitting or not growing carrots or not going to the farmer's market, they went exclusively to online pickup at the market. So you have to order ahead and pick up at the market stand, which works great for them because it eliminates the time that it's taking to sit at the market stand and wonder if all the stuff is going to get sold. So they have the guaranteed sale and more time to spend with their family. Okay, so just quick takeaways and then anybody else wants to talk, please feel free. For this to work for I think any farm, you have to stay super flexible in what you're willing to do. And I have never been the type of person that will change quickly. I want to dip my toe in and try not doing, you know, winter markets first and see how it affects our revenue before I say no more markets. I want to try shrinking my CSA down before I say no more ever again, right? Staying flexible, but also these huge changes can sometimes be so chaotic and disastrous and it's hard to get back if you change your mind. Um, you've got to know your cost of production. I see so many farmers asking how much people charge for things. And the answer is, how much did it cost you to grow it? And you can't make big changes like this if you have no idea what's making you money and what's not. And just, I think for so long, Hans and I were just content and unhappy, but we were afraid that we would somehow lose our identity as farmers if we gave up. And were we calling it giving up? That's what it felt like. It was a failure. It's not. It's 
evolution, right? It's growth, it's life. And I'm not afraid to change what Hans and I want moving forward. And knowing your customer now really helps when you're try trying to determine what they want later. So when I actually want zucchini and summer squash, they're perfectly content. They're tired of it. They don't want anymore. Sorry, hi mowing. We don't want your zucchini and your summer squash. <laughs> So really knowing what your customers want, that way you can kind of see how they complement what you want to. But most importantly, you have to know why you're doing this. And that's the biggest takeaway from Hans and I is that we lost our why. Every reason that we wanted to farm, we were no longer finding anymore. We were doing this to pay our bills. And that, if that's the only reason to work 65, 70 hours a day, then we're totally in the wrong industry, right? So we had to reestablish and figure out why we were doing this. That's it. So thank you guys so much. It was such a pleasure to be here. You can't see, but I'm smiling really big behind my mask. <laughs> Um, so we have harvest and post harvest sheets that we use that are kind of like directives for when we're going out into the field to pack or to wash and there's columns there for recording time which is usually for us one of our biggest costs that's hard to track so we'll uh, over the course of multiple times not every single time track the time that it's taking to harvest and the time that it's taking to wash and pack those orders. And that's a big part of how we're determining the cost. And then Hans takes that information and just does the calculations, adding the cost of seed, the cost of rent. We're, it, this is not a perfect formula. We're not factoring in all of the things, but just those big pieces that are easy information for us to get to. And if I can tell just from that, that we're not profitable before I start adding in you know, property, tax and, <laughs> and all that type of thing, then I already know. We need to make either a change on the crop or we need to make a change in our efficiency and how we're doing something. Yeah. Hold on just one second. We have two more. No. He asked, how do we justify when we're these costs, these infrastructure costs, when we're, when we're shifting our size of our farm? Is that yeah. basically it? <laughs> I only laugh because I don't think that we do. I, I, I mean, I, he really likes to buy farm stuff. I don't know how many other farm partners have a partner on their farm that likes to buy farm stuff. So we don't always justify it until after the fact. <laughs> uh, the building was an easy one. From a labor retention standpoint, there was no way we were going to be able to retain people who had to lift. And it was not safe anymore to be lifting 70 or 80 pounds of root vegetables at a time and stepping them up into a cooler. And we could never expand into another wholesale um, bracket size without professional cooling which was the other big part to that too. Yeah. 
That's a good question. So for CSA software, she asked, what did we start with and what are we using today? We started with a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet. I would enter names and email addresses and if they had paid, and I would forget to do that a lot. And I would have people call me and say, well, I would tell them, hey, you owe me money. And they'd be like, we sent that check. And I didn't know that's how unorganized I was at the beginning. So then we went to Farmigo specifically for the choice feature, for their store feature, but also because I needed a way to organize and I didn't really like Small Farm Central very much. Um, so we're still with Farmigo. There is, if you're interested, Farmigo, Farmigo. yep. Uh, if you're interested, the University of Wisconsin in Madison, I think it was, or Fair Share CSA Coalition put together an excellent comparison of all the different C CSA software tools out there. And it's the comparisons are from farmers using them, plus the technical information like cost and contract and capabilities or whatever. And it is an amazing tool for anybody that's, that's looking for that. And it's available for free. We have time for one more. Our enterprise budget is a spreadsheet. Yep, yep. So at some point I realized I'm really bad at that stuff. <laughs> so we hire, um, we have a bookkeeper and an accountant that helps me with